that are uh, outside in the entryway, just kind of getting grouped and regrouped and whatnot, come on in and sit down and get comfortable. We're about to indulge in some pretty intense praise and worship this morning and uh, hear a great message from Pastor Paul. Right now, uh, let's get into our call to worship, shall we? We also would like to welcome the Pelkey family this morning. Hey, We're going to have a baptism this morning, so wow, yeah. this is going to be a very liturgical day for all of us.
Here comes a very lovely lady who happened to have graduated from high school just yesterday. This is Emily Fernside. Good morning. Okay, that was pretty good, and I'm tired, so I'm not going to make you do it again. <laughs> For those of you who don't know me, my name is Emily, and if you're new here today, a special welcome goes out to you. I have just a couple of quick announcements for you. First of all, in your bulletin, there's these two little white pieces of paper. The smaller one is our prayer card. If there's anything going on in your life that you want somebody to pray about, like that you think Paul should pray for you about or that you want our prayer chain to pray about, anything like that, you can write it on this card and put that in the offering basket when it goes by. And the bigger one is our attendance sheet. Even if you're new here, we kind of like to know who's visiting. So if you want more information about our church, we can send it out to you. And so the people that are members here can kind of keep updated in what's going on. If you could put that in the offering basket as well, that would be wonderful. Also, there's this big yellow sheet of paper, which means, yay, church in the park. Sorry, I like church in the park because it's outside and there's no air conditioner fans. And that is going to be Saturday evening, June 30th at 5.30 p.m. We're going to start dinner at 5.30, and the worship service excuse me, starts at 7. It says that they're going to provide the plates and the utensils and the hamburger patties and an orange drink. But there's still some other stuff that we need because it wouldn't be very good to have hamburger patties and no buns or chips, chips or relish or anything to put on your hamburger patty with no bun. Baked beans. Baked beans. Okay, we got it. So there's these two little yellow sheets, and the reason that there's two of them is because we're asking you to check two things that you can bring. There's salad, vegetable, chips, buns, dessert, condiments, and other. I don't know what goes in other, but it's there if you think of something else. And you can check two of these and put those in the offering baskets when they go by, and then the other one, you can check two and stick it on your refrigerator so you remember, oh yeah, I'm supposed to bring hamburger buns. So that way you can kind of remind yourself because I know I'd forget. Also, we have the Simpson Shelter sign up starting today. That's a for those of you who don't know, it's a homeless shelter that our church goes to and we serve we bring food to these people and we serve them and we kind of show them God's love. And that is going to be on June 24th. If you need more information about that, it's in our monthly bulletin and we are looking for a lot of people to go. The sign up table is right outside the door. So if you are interested in that, your opportunity is right out there. And also, this weekend is the youth lock-in in in Waterville. We're going to go down there, and it's a really good weekend. We kind of have a discussion with Paul and Deb Marzon. Just hang out, spend the weekend together. If you have questions, you can ask either Paul or Deb Marzon, or you can talk to Sam, who's right there. There she is. Thank you. It's time for children's time. Yeah, this is one of the highlights of the morning. Hi, kids. How you doing? I'm sure Chris will be right up here. It looks like he's got uh, quite a few things that he's trying to carry up. (laughs) Did you kids pray yet this morning? Have you prayed about anything good? Prayed for a nice sunny day? I bet you prayed to see Chris. Did you pray to see me? Man, I need a lot of prayers. That'd be good if he did pray for me. So how's everyone doing? Look how much this filled up while I was gone last week. Wow, you guys brought a lot in here. Raise your hand if you've heard of a guy named King Solomon. Who's heard of King Solomon? Do you know where you can find the story about King Solomon in the Bible? Old Testament or New Testament? Who knows? Old. It's in 2 Kings. If you want to go there, you can learn a little bit more about King Solomon. There's two things he did that I thought were really cool. One was a prayer that he, that he asked God for or something. And we'll talk about that sometime. The other thing he did is he built something. Who knows what King Solomon built? He built this for the Ark of the Covenant so it would have a place to live. Do you know? He built, some, he built a temple. Does anybody remember that now? He built a temple. And back then, one of the things they had to do is they had to work with poor people. They had to work with gold, and they worked with bronze, and they worked with silver, and they, had, and they used pine was the type of wood they used when they built the temple. And you know what? Do you think just anybody knew how to work with gold? You think just anybody knew how to use silver to build with? So what did they have to do? They had to go out and they had to find craftsmen or people that were really, really good at building things with gold. They had to know how to shape it just right because God gave specific directions on how to build the temple. He gave those to Moses and then they were passed down and Solomon used those as his guide in how to build the temple. So they had to shape the silver, and they had to shape the bronze, and they had to know just how long to cut the wood. 
So how do you think they went about getting those people? How do you think they were able to get people to build a temple? Well, they had to spend some money, didn't they? They went out and they hired these people to come in and build this temple. And they did that with money. And guess where the money came from? Who knows? Well, sure, it always starts with God. But where else did it come from? came through tithing and it came through the giving at the temple when people came in for service. So that's what we want to keep doing. We want to keep filling this up. So if you have any change in your pockets today, I'll be glad to take it from you. Because $5 will buy a brick for our new church. Okay? And you know what we can do that's even as good or better than giving the money? We can pray. We can pray that we'll get plenty of money to build that new church. For our new church. Yes. So we're going to do that in just a second, but I have to tell you something very important. Is everybody listening? Very important. When we get done right here with our prayer, we're going to go right back out there and sit down with Mommy and Daddy because we're going to do something new this summer. We're going to stay out there while we do all of our singing so we can learn some new songs. Won't that be neat? Because I'm looking forward to that. And then, right before Pastor Paul starts to talk and preach about Solomon today, then we'll go to our kids' classes. Everybody got that? So when we're done praying, where are we going? Where are we going when we get done praying right here? Where are we going? Back to mom and dad. That's right, okay? You guys want to say a prayer with me? I need a lot of help. Help me out. Close your eyes, heads bowed, hands together. Dear Jesus, thank you for Solomon. Thank you for the example to get the money and how to build the temple. We ask for your blessing as we pursue our new church. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. What an anointed message this morning from Chris and with the kids. It's time now to turn to our neighbors and say good morning and let them know how the week went for each and every one of us. Some of you have caught on to the idea that this is a stand-up type of a deal. So stand up and say howdy to about six or seven or eight people around you. Hey, Jeff. Jeff. You turn your mic down and speak into it closer. Say, I'm going to need some help from the help from the youth up here. With we want to see Jesus lifted high. Come on, kids, I want you up here. We want to see. 
we want to see Jesus lift in high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lift in high. Step by step, we're moving forward.
over the mountains and the sea. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with blood for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hand. For I will always sing when you're looking down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. Lift it up again. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever and ever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love
until that day. This Lord, I pray, help me to be like you. I know that I have a long way to go. I know that I have a long way to go until I make pure and true. But till that day, this Lord, I pray, help me to be like you. But till that day, but till that day, this Lord, I pray, to be like you. Hallelujah. If, those, if there's some of you out there that feel compelled to sit down, you can go ahead and do so, but you're encouraged here to indulge in freedom of worship. Uh, that could mean standing up, sitting down, kneeling, bowing, However you feel driven by the Spirit, it's, uh, it's entirely up to you. Would you please, uh, this time, bow your heads in prayer with me? I want to offer up a prayer of thanksgiving to the Lord. Lord, it pleases us so much to know that uh, we are in your presence here in this house of worship. And we just ask that, uh, we ask with a great deal of thanksgiving in our heart that you would bless us with more of the presence of your Spirit and that uh, your spirit would be with us in all that we do and that it would permeate through us and just saturate us and overflow with, from within us, Lord. We're grateful, so grateful for your forgiveness and your love and your mercy, even though we fall short continually. But you are a God of grace and mercy. And that's, why we, that's why we just thank you with all of our hearts and souls, Lord. We ask for your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Nothing pleases me more than to worship you. Nothing pleases me more than to give you praise. Nothing pleases me more than to say,
pleases me more than to worship you. Nothing pleases me more than to give you praise. Nothing pleases me more than to say how much I love you. Nothing pleases me more than to please you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. That's right. You can be seated. scripture for you this morning, but um, really quick, I just wanted to share with you, um, I haven't really done you an injustice, because I get up here and I read almost every Sunday, and I'm not excited about it, you know, I, I'm not excited as I should be. Um, a couple weeks ago, my friend, um, Brian Gobar, asked me, just straight out, why are you a Christian? And I didn't know at the time, I had no clue, because sometimes we just, we get stuck and we don't think about it at all. And I, I looked at him, and I just said, because it's real. And I thought about it. I have been thinking about it for a while. And this, this book right here is real. And everything that God says is real. So um, just turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Second Chronicles 9. And be excited about the word as Mark reads it to you. She said to the king, the report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe what they said until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half the greatness of your wisdom has told me, was told me. You have far exceeded the report I heard. How happy your men must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Praise be to the Lord your God, who has delighted in you and placed you on his throne as king to rule for the Lord your God. Because of the love of your God for Israel and his desire to uphold them forever, he has made you king over them to maintain justice and righteousness. Now from Second Chronicles 9, 29 and 30. As for the other events of Solomon's reign, from beginning to end, are they not written in the records of Nathan the prophet, in the prophecy of Ahijah the Shilonite, and in the visions of Iddo the seer concerning Jeroboam son of Nebat? Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel 40 years. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for every person here, Lord. Thank you for the desire you've given to them to come to give thanks to you for all you've done through the lives of Father. It is so nice to know that we are forgiven and we give you all the glory, Father. We just pray that as we continue to worship you through the speaking of your word, we just pray that, Lord, you will just pour out your spirit upon Pastor Paul and upon each person in this room that Lord your word would go forth and don't go back to you empty but would accomplish the purpose for which it was sent bless us Lord as a body of believers heal our diseases Lord mm -hmm. please meet our needs we ask and forgive all our sins we pray that you would continue to receive us graciously in your presence because we don't deserve it. But we're so thankful for the blood of Jesus that covers us all and presents us into your holy presence. And we are your children, Lord. Lord, we love you. Mm. And please continue to speak through Pastor Paul as he speaks forth your word. In the holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. 
this time, if the children like to go to children's church, yeah, feel free to do so. Kind of our summer schedule is a little different, where the children are dismissed right before the message. And so if you have a, you're a new person here today and um, aren't familiar with our children's church, we are meeting out in the hallway. And uh, if you have a young person that maybe like to be in the nursery, you're welcome to take them there as well. It's my wife, Deborah Marzan. She's over here. She'll be glad to take any kids. Money jug, I believe. Um, it's right over here. Here we go. <laughs> there goes the money jug. I'd like I have a little opening clip art I have for you up here. Um, if you look at it, you have kind of a, a group or a family going through a, a drive through church, and it says actually tithe through on the little sign. I don't know if you can read that. And um, in there, they're ordering the guys, ordering, I'll have a sermonette. Tidbites, sound bites, half baked nuggets, and some handshakes, and hold the judgment. And then he asks back, Would you like life's, um, like sentence prayers with that? That's what I like about Baudelaire. He doesn't give us a sentence prayer, he gives us a real prayer. Amen? Doesn't, I feel the spirit when Baudelaire's preaching. Oh, man. He did an awesome job yesterday. If you have um, cable, you should check out Cable Channel 6. Baudelaire gave a wonderful message yesterday, and our praise team did a great job, and they're going to be on a TV show called Praise Break. And they'll be releasing that in about 10 to 14 days. And they'll be playing through the month of uh, July and the end of June. So check that out and see um, Baudelaire giving God's word on television. One of the reasons I put that up there is that today we're going through a little bit more of a technical side of our sermon. If you have your sermon notes this morning, it might be helpful to pull those out. And people ask why we do those is because we don't want to be a light church. We don't want to be a church that just kind of halfway looks at scripture, but we really want to get into it. And so, from time to time, we do a little bit more in-depth study. That doesn't mean that we're not sensitive to people that perhaps have not grown up in the church. A lot of what we try to do here at the church is to reach out to people, to let them know no matter where you are in your faith journey, you're welcome at Crossroads. We also do not want to just kind of take God's word for granted and to just kind of gloss over some of the more hard truths or more difficult understandings, but to get into in-depth and, and to go through them. Today, we're going through an overview of Solomon. And we're kind of wrapping up this whole section we've been going through in terms of 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. And we've been talking a lot about this time period in history. So today we're going to look at this overview of Solomon, what he contributed, and exactly um, how he left his mark, if you will, on the nation of Israel. I'm going to be talking a little bit about how Solomon did something unusual. And that was, if you look at our sermon title, he was kind of a bull in a bear market. Now, those of you who aren't into investments maybe don't know what that means. So I'm going to, do we have some people that actually know those terms? Some investment type people. What is a bull market? Someone raise their hand if they want to define what a bull market would be. Yes. A bull market is a, a market where the, the stocks keep going up, right? And that the market is, as some people would define as good. You're making money, the, the, the Dow Industrial and the NASDAQ and all those are keep heading in the upward direction. What would be a bear market? Yes? Exactly. That's where it's kind of going down, and it's a struggle. And where Solomon is doing such a great job here is that there were a lot of things that were having issues in the life of Israel. He was actually heading in a downward market, and they were having problems at the end of King David. If you remember the story when he had slept with Bathsheba, and there were problems with worship, and people were falling away from believing in God, and in steps Solomon. And even though in the downward trend, the NASDAQ was dropping, the Dow Industrials were going down, in comes Solomon. He says, hey, we've got to turn this around, and let's take it back up a notch. And he does that through a couple of different ways, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. The first one is that Solomon was a bull because he invested in Israel, even though there were greater nations around him. Now, this is an interesting principle because sometimes you get this, like, lower nation complex. And that's what, that's what Israel was going through. They had the Egyptians, and they had um, all these other great nations around them the Macedonians during that time period, and others that were really struggling for prominence. But that didn't let Solomon at all get discouraged. He said, you know what? Let's work with them. Let's piggyback off of the greatness that they are doing, set up alliances, work through them, and so that we too can enjoy in their prosperity. Here's some of the things that Solomon's leadership and accomplishments include. First of all, diplomatic influence and peace. He had peace, and that was a great thing. Just like in our nation right now, we've experienced a lot of our prosperity because why? We're not fighting in any wars right now. We're not taxing people at a heavier rate to take money and put it into armament. What we're trying to do is to have a peacetime prosperity. This is what Solomon was doing. By building these alliances, he was able to allow his people to have more economic income for themselves rather than giving it to taxes. 
David had expanded Israel's sphere of influence through war. He set back the boundaries and the borders, but Solomon was doing it through diplomacy. Now, we've talked about this before. Do you remember how many wives Solomon have? He had a lot of diplomacy. How many wives did he have? He had 1,000, 700 wives and 300 concubines, to be exact. And a lot of the reasons why he did that was not because of wanting to have that many wives for um, sexual purposes or for children purposes. Or a lot of it was, in that day, diplomatic immunity. <laughs> if you married somebody from that country, as particularly if they're of royal heritage, then they were less likely to attack you. And so he saw the wisdom in that by doing these marriages or these alliances, he was able to keep his country from being invaded by those um, particular nations. The other thing that Solomon was great at in terms of his accomplishments was economic prosperity. You see, Solomon was aggressive economically as his father was militarily. He did this in a number of ways. He was the first person to set up the whole type of economic structure with farming in a different way, so they, they were less of the um, problems they had because they began to work on the irrigation. And they were able to do that because there were not foreign troops coming in and knocking down the dams and, and blocking up things. He was able to do a lot of these things, again, because of the peace. And yet, in spite of this, Solomon's army was actually larger than his father David's. He had over 12,000 chariots and riders. And I think it was that whole thing of strength that people saw, and so they didn't um, challenge that or come to invade Solomon like they did with David. The third and the biggest thing that I think that we remember David or Solomon for is the temple. If you look at your outline there in number three, it says Solomon's temple was one of the greatest accomplishments. And I want to take a little bit to look at this temple. As we're in the church building process, it's important to look at why a lot of the symbolism of a church, synagogue, come from this original temple. Um, this, the temple was located at the site where Abraham had been commanded to sacrifice his son Isaac. That's an important thing to remember because that as you hear all these fights in the Middle East right now about the Temple Mount and the site, it's very important to the Jews that it be in that specific location. For us, we say, well, we can put a church wherever there's a good place for visibility on a street corner. For us, it's Cedar and Dodd. But for them, they said that the temple has to be in this specific place. In fact, later on, they build a second temple in the northern half of Israel, and there's a huge debate about whether you should even be able to go worship there because it's not the place to worship God. This temple was built of stone, it was paneled with cedar, and it was inlaid with gold. Over $20 billion of gold. And that's in their days. $20 billion of gold in their days. This is not inflationary as to our days. Think about that. The whole thing was inlaid with gold. And if you think there was a lot of gold, there was 10 times as much silver used in the construction as there was gold. And they don't even have an estimate as the cost of what that would have cost them. There were these two great pillars out front they kind of had a flaming light at night to symbolize, if you remember, the, the mountaintop presence of, of Israel's God when he took them through the wilderness and had the pillar cloud um, by day and by night. So all this was represented. I'm going to show a picture here so you can kind of look at the outside of what they think would have been Solomon's temple. You see here the, the burning incense altar on the right. You see behind it is this basin. It's called the, 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 the Sea of Basin there, and it's a huge baptism bowl. And um, you can't really get a scope of what that would be like, other than I could tell you that that little bowl that's standing there is a little bigger than our baptism bowl. Just to put it in perspective, that bowl weighed in bronze about 30,000 tons. It held 10,000 gallons of water. When they did a purification ritual, they did a purification ritual. Those little things that you can't see much underneath them are the stands. Those are life-size oxen. The bowl itself was over seven feet in the air on the back of 12 oxen representing the 12 tribes of Israel. So you can get to imagine the size of their baptism bowl. In front of it was this altar where they did burning of animal sacrifices. They also had altars inside I'll talk about in a bit. But this altar is um, actually, you can't see it from this perspective, but there were actually steps going up to it where the priest would walk up to it. So like when we have our sanctuary or a traditional sanctuary, you see the steps going up and forward to the altar and that same type of perspective. And so they did the animal sacrifices out here where they would burn the entire animal, where they just did blood sacrifices and different sacrifices on the inside. Can we show the inside a second? You have here on the altar of incense. Again, this was not where the animals were burned, but either the blood or different forms of incense. And this was the holy place. Now the women, no disrespect intended, <laughs> the women could worship in the temple courts around the outside. The men could come into the holy place, but only the priests could go into the most holy place. So there was this progression. You know, in the Catholic Church, they may call it the narthex. Then you had the sanctuary, 
And then you had the altar. And in fact, it wasn't until Vatican II that women, believe it or not, were not allowed on the altar in a Catholic church. That was considered unholy. And now since they've um, realigned that and begin to look at the theology behind that, but it was that same type of thing that was passed on through the generations from the synagogue and the temple worship, is that the closer you drew to God, and there was that sexism that was built into some of that that is a whole other sermon. But, um, <laughs> but you can see the holy place and the altar of incense were those that would come in and give those thanks offerings. And then once a year they would go to the Ark of the Covenant and the great high priest would go in there. And when he would go in there, they'd actually tie a rope around him because if he didn't do something right, they wouldn't want to go in after him to find out what he did wrong. If he opened the lid wrong or he wasn't pure before God, they said that he'd be stricken down dead. So they just wait and they pull on the rope every now and then to see if he's still alive. And if he wasn't, they just pull the rope out and there would be a dead priest. Who goes in next? <laughs> Pastor Paul didn't make it. Baudelaire, your turn. <laughs> and they'd go in and they'd, they'd worship in the ark and they would, on it was actually a throne. And um, that same throne is mentioned in Revelations. And on that throne, they said the presence of God rested for judgment. And to hear, it was the, the, the throne of mercy, the judgment seat. And so you kind of get a sense of this, this Im immense building that was built and all that Solomon put into so that they could come into holiness with God, so that they could fulfill what David had started, which is a loving relationship with God. And David made a lot of the plans for this, but he wasn't able to fulfill it. But because of his sin, God told that Solomon would be the one to fulfill the building of the temple. Um, one of the things that's interesting, if you want to flip back to the other picture a second, Chad, you see those two pillars on the outside there? One is called the Jacob pillar, the one on the left, and that's really the pillar of beauty. And if you look at the one on the right, it's called the Boaz pillar. And that is to remind them of God's strength. Again, the softness or the feminine side of God, the, the beauty of God, the nurturing side of God, and then the strength of God, his judgment. The fact that he's a, a just God. And both of those pillars stand out as symbols for the people to see on the outside. One of the most interesting things, if you look at this immense structure, not a single bit of mortar was used. If you look around our gym here, you see all these wonderful bricks and all these block. They were brought in, they put some cement, they laid the next block on top. These were cut with such precision that no concrete or mortar was used for a single lane of these blocks. When I've done archaeology with my wife in Israel, it was amazing to pull apart these structures and to see the fact that the stones were cut so precisely that they laid on there just balanced. Just to put it one step further, you know how challenging this was? There was a rule in the Levitical law that no chisels may be used in the presence of God. In other words, every stone that was cut had to be cut in the quarry precisely, brought there and laid down, and if it didn't fit, it had to be hauled all the way back to the quarry and be recut because no chisels were to be used in the construction of the temple in the presence of God. Can you imagine that? Imagine bringing and lugging this 10,000-pound stone all the way those, through the miles and miles through the desert to, from the quarry to where the temple was to be built. You get it all the way there and you lay it into place and it's just a little bit off. <laughs> Can you hear the construction manager? <laughs> you can't swear because God's there. <laughs> Doesn't want to take the Lord's name in vain and get struck down by lightning right on the spot. So he hauls in and goes, okay, guys, load it back up. Take it back to the quarry. Tink, 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 tink. Bring it back down again. <laughs> now you know why it took almost 40 years to finish this thing. Because <laughs> it was immense. It was huge. But it was a project of glory. I'm going on too much. I know that. But I just wanted to put in perspective the glory that Solomon's temple has never been repeated. Even when Herod rebuilt the temple, they could never rebuild it to the splendor and to the glory that Solomon originally built it. Enough about Solomon and his accomplishments. Let's look at Solomon the man, if you're looking at your notes. Solomon the man. He was not only a great leader and accomplished a lot, but he was a great spiritual person. And one of the key to Solomon's success was his wisdom and his love for the Lord. Many times we forget that. That this was not a man-made project. This temple could not have been built from man-made wisdom. It was given to him, the plans, by God. And because he was in tune with God's wisdom and his love for God, he was able to do such incredible things. I'd like to remind people that wisdom without love for the Lord is only knowledge. When Adam was asleep, there was a story about a young boy who said when Adam was asleep, um, he learned in Sunday school that there was a woman that came from Adam's side. And so he was so excited to go back and talk to his parents about this knowledge he got um, about in Sunday school class. And he talked to his mom and daddy after church and said, you know what, it is so cool that God was able to create woman from Adam. And the mom and dad said, well, that's great. Did you learn this in Sunday school? Yeah, I learned that when Adam was asleep, they took out all his brains and made a woman to be his aide. <laughs> Some of the women are going, yeah, amen. 
The guys are going, this isn't funny, Paul. I don't like this joke. But in essence, sometimes that's what happens, is that we use our brains and we think that we have knowledge. And so like, shh. But without the relationship, the heart, it means nothing. And that's what Solomon had, is he had a combination of both, both brains and the heart. If you turn your Bible out, turn to 1 Kings 3.3. 3. 1 Kings 3.3. 3. It's a passage we looked at earlier when looking at the life of Solomon. And in this passage, Solomon is asking God for wisdom. He says, Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the statutes of his father David. He showed his love for the Lord, in other words, by following the law. You see, that's one of the ways we show love. It's not just a feeling. It's not saying, well, I'm just on fire for God. And woo, woo, you know, we sing the praise songs. We get all excited. How did Solomon show his love for the Lord? By walking in the statutes. That means obedience, folks. We can say we love God, but when you leave this place, does your obedience follow? When you're praising and glorifying God in worship, does that worship extend throughout the week when you're at work or you're at school or you're on summer break? Do you follow his statutes? That's the true sign of love. And in fact, when Solomon's reign was greatest is when he was following the statutes. And he began to lose his reign because he stopped following those same statutes. I also like to remind persons that sermon is a spiritual gift that is based upon our relationship with God. Knowledge and wisdom do not come simply by learning more facts. It's through that relationship with God that even when we study, if we're reading God's Word, or we're looking at a textbook, or we're, or we're reading the, nearest, the newest book in Bible study class, whatever it is, we're not truly able to understand it or discern its wisdom unless we're taking it to the Lord in prayer. We're, we're in essence, um, deciphering it or decoding it through the Holy Spirit. Wisdom is, in essence, not who you know. Excuse me. Wisdom is not what you know, but who you know. Wisdom is not what you know, but who you know. It's a story about a woman. It's a true story about the Titanic, not the movie version, although that's wonderful and DiCaprio and all the love and romance. But the true Titanic, there were a lot of awesome stories that came out about of God's faithfulness and love and all the things that happened because people there worked towards helping each other because of their love of God. And there were many people that sacrificed their love because they realized that they were going to go to heaven. So they sacrificed their life for somebody else on a boat. There's tons of stories like that, but the story I want to share with you today is about a woman who was on a lifeboat, and they were beginning to lower, and she says, wait a second, I've got to go back for something. She got out of the boat, and she ran back. She ran through the, the casino, which was just littered by this time with gold coins and money. She literally had to wade her feet through all the, all the, 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 the money that was there, and the chips, and the, and the gold that had been laying on the floor, because the, the, the ship had begun to go at an angle, and everything was spilling all over the place. She ran through the casino, and then she went through what was then known as the special room behind the casino where they had all the jewelry and all the things that were locked up and the boxes had begun falling over. And there were diamonds, literally diamonds, all over the floor and necklaces and pearls and precious gems. And she waded through those to the back of the kitchen where she grabbed three oranges and then ran back through the diamonds, ran back through all the money and jumped in the boat and got away to safety. She picked three small oranges in preference to a crate of diamonds. But her boat was one of the few that made it through that night. Many of them didn't even make it through even though they were on lifeboats to survive. And she shared those three oranges in small sections with those on, on her boat. And because of that energy, they were able to, to row back and pick up some of those other lost people and help some of the people that were struggling because they had that little bit of extra energy. You see, she used godly wisdom Instead of taking the money, taking the jewels, taking the things that would be obvious to all of those around her, she ran back for something that she saw was more precious, which that was nutrients. And I would like to use that as a spiritual idea to think about what do we crave after that we think is so wonderful, that we value so much. So many times it's these physical, monetary things. When we have God's Word, when we have the presence of the Holy Spirit, when we have the things that would give us true wisdom and true discernment. Again, wisdom is not what you know, but who you know. One of the things I'd also like to remind you is that even the other leaders respected Solomon's wisdom and his love of God. I'm not going to go in the passage, but if you have it, it was read earlier, 2 Chronicles 9, 5 through 8. We talked about that a little bit earlier. And it's about the Queen of Sheba coming to pay tribute to Solomon. 
She was a pagan um, worshiper. And other nations around her that set up things were pagan worshipers. But even they saw that Solomon was different. He was different even than his father David. They could see in him the love of God and the peace of God in his heart. And I think that is what is one of the keys to why they set up these relationships. Is they knew that he would honor them. That they could trust him. That Solomon would not go back on his word. He was an expedient leader. And they trusted that. We have to also remember, though, that Solomon was a man that struggled spiritually. 1 Kings 11.4 reminds us, As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God. That's part of the tragedy. In spite of what a great ruler and leader he was, his heart began to turn because he made some major mistakes. That's the same kind of warning for us. I was talking with our building team the other day, and I'm so excited. We're getting closer and closer. If you want to hear some exciting news, talk to Jim Soffer. Raise your hand, Jim. Jim's been working diligently as the head of our building team, and we've, he's been working negotiating. We had a new negotiation Friday that's going to um, really increase the, the value of our land and some of the neat things that are happening there. And just ask him about some of those things going on. But as excited as I am about our building project, I remember the warning of Solomon. Solomon built a great temple, but he began to fall from the Lord. I just want to encourage us that as we're collecting and gathering money for our building fund and we're doing all these wonderful things to move into this building, is that we not forget the reason why. This is just a ministry tool. Just like being in the school, we can worship anywhere, God, in spirit and truth. But we have to remember the reason why we're building this building. And once we get in it, to not forget that. To not get comfortable like Solomon did once the temple was accomplished. But our goal is not just to build a building, folks. Our goal is to reach out in love and acceptance so that all may become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And in our mission statement, it doesn't say anything about building a building. It says about being a biblically functioning community of believers. Now, we can do that with or without a building. The building is just a ministry tool. And we're going to have one someday. I know it. Praise God. <laughs> well, the setup team are going, praise God, yeah. But we have to not fall into the trap of Solomon. He said that once he accomplished his goal of the building, he forgot about why the building was there. And we have to remember not to fall into that same trap. We all have to remember that not to get so hung up on our accomplishments that if we forget why we're doing what we're doing. 1 Corinthians 10.12 reminds us, If you think that you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. That's a warning by Paul to say that it's so important to always be seeking the presence of the Lord in everything we do so that we do not stumble and fall. I would suggest to you that Solomon's great strength was his wisdom, but Solomon's wisdom was also his greatest weakness. Solomon's wisdom was also his greatest weakness. It was his greatest weakness because he began to rely upon himself and not upon the power of the Holy Spirit. Solomon's greatest weakness was his wisdom because he thought, I am so intelligent and so smart that I can even outwit God. He began to build altars, pagan altars on the high places and let his wives begin to, to rule the kingdom and allowed them to start animal sacrifices in another way again. And in his wisdom was also his fall. In closing, I want to remind people that we can never retreat from our dependence upon God. We can never retreat in our dependence upon God. It's upon this dependence that everything that we build and do at Crossroads Church will be rated as successful. Not successful in in God, in um, people's eyes. That's not important. What is important is the success in God's eyes. That only comes when we show that we are weak and that we need him closing, I had an illustration, but it's gone. Somebody see a visor I had set up here? Someone from the praise team move that? Anybody? A little visor that was sitting up on the stage here? Oh, okay. Ah, he wanted to take it home. I know. Yeah. <laughs> you thought that looked pretty cool, didn't you? You're thinking, hey, afterwards, I can ride this around. Yeah. This is a, a visor. Mine, there's actually other people in our church that are aware of visors as well. You may have seen them on a praise team on occasion. I think that person wears their visor something like this, doesn't he? Have we seen this person? Anybody recognize this person? My wife and I were doing a rummage sale, a garage sale, and we're digging through all the old stuff. And out came the old Honda visor. In my more wild and reckless days, I used to love riding motorcycles, particularly um, off-road motorcycles. And in those days, you didn't necessarily have to wear a helmet. And in fact, it wasn't very cool if you did. In fact, the guys that I work, rode with in high school often wore visors similar to this. And of course, since they rode visors, I thought I had to wear a visor as well. 
So this is my old Honda visor I used to wear instead of a helmet like an intelligent person would have done. And I remember riding one weekend with my group of buddies because we all blew off church that weekend to go out riding, which was not an otherwise decision on my part. And we were out in a gravel pit riding our, our motorbikes, running up and down the hills, jumping and doing all that we could just to show off to each other, to see who was the most impressive, to see who was the best. I remember one of the guys named Jake was going to show us all. He built this great big jump. He was going to zoom up there and he was going to fly up over the top and then try to jump over this part of, of the, the gravel pit, if you will, just to show us how tough he was and how he could ride so cool. So he got it back and he got a big run. He's kind of like that Evil Knievel days. Remember that far back, you know? He was his own version of Evil Knievel in my small town of Waterville. Jake runs all the way up there and he zooms off the top and he must have hit that thing at 50 or 60 miles an hour. And you can imagine that he had not uh, practiced, perhaps, the whole idea of centrifugal force and the pulling over the back over the front. And what Jake did is he landed totally upside down on the other side of the gravel pit. We all thought he was dead. We thought he wasn't going to make it. And I remember the fact that we all ran around and we just saw him laying there in a crumpled pile. And his bike had bounced and bounced and bounced and was laying further down. He was totally unconscious. And of course, Jake wasn't one to wear a helmet either. His visor was laying in the ground next to him, as was a lot of blood. And I remember the fact that I had um, been with Jake a lot of time. We'd grown up in school together. We'd hung out together. We'd rode bike together. We'd done a lot of things together. But at that moment, I realized I'd never asked Jake if he was a Christian. As much time as I spent with Jake, as many hours as we rode together, we rode horse together, motorcycle together, pickup truck, e-braking, anything you want to name. We had fun. But I never asked about him his faith relationship with Jesus Christ. And I got down on my knees and I began to pray, praying for Jake. And this is one of the first times I can remember as a kid ever laying hands on anybody and praying for them by name. I understood who God was and I knew that I had to worship God at church because my folks made me go. This was the first time I recall going back and actually saying, God, I want your help. My friend is laying here, and I don't know what to do. I remember realizing that I was totally dependent upon God. There's nothing that I could do to bring my friend Jake back. I remember how excited I was when, after we prayed there, I began to see him move a little bit. The first words out of his mouth, <laughs> I hate to say it, but they were not exclamations of joy to God. He did use the God word, however. <laughs> and a few others. But when I saw this visor again, it reminded me and all the thoughts flooded back to me of how my parents had instilled into me as a young boy that I was dependent upon God for everything. And even though I had my rebellious periods where I turned from that and I rejected that, God didn't give up on me. And in a moment of truth, when I began to realize that I was not as cool as I thought I was or that I wasn't all that, first thing I did is I turned to God. I turned to God. Maybe you have a friend that you've sat with, talked with, played with, hung out with, but do they know God? Do they know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Are you totally dependent upon God in your life? Are you turning to Him for everything that you do and everything that you believe as a source of your wisdom and your strength. In a little bit, we're going to be sharing in a baptism. And as we share in this baptism, that is what we're doing, is we're reminding ourselves as a community of faith that God is with us, that we are totally dependent upon Him, and we're dependent upon His love as we raise this child in the Christian faith. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we just thank You for the fact that you give us a model of wisdom and stature like Solomon. We can look at his great accomplishments, the building of the temple. We can look at the great things that he has done in terms of um, the allies and the peacemaking and all that he gave back to God. We can also look at his strength of character, the way that he got wisdom because he had a relationship with you. And yet we can also have a sense of caution as to how he fell from you because he began to take that wisdom for granted and that relationship for granted. Lord, we pray this day that if we have a strain in our relationship with you, that we confess that right now. And that we come whole before you and clean before, before you and say, Lord, I'm just not doing what I should be doing to be closer to you. Help me in that. 
Help me to be humble and dependent, totally upon you, not to be pulling myself up on my spiritual bootstraps, but to realize that when I am weak, that you are strong. And Lord, we just pray this morning that if there's someone that doesn't know you, the Lord, that they would just take the courage right now, in this time and in this place, and say, Lord, I want to love you. Lord, I want you to come into my heart so that I can have a relationship with you and I can receive godly wisdom and discernment. Lord, I pray that there may be someone on our minds right now that as we're reflecting that there's somebody else that doesn't know Jesus. And maybe we know you, Lord, but there's that Jake out there, there's that person that we hang out with that just doesn't know you and you need to use us to be that conduit, that person that reaches out to them. Lord, give us the courage this week to not be afraid to reach out to the Jakes of this world, the people that don't know you but need to know you. I just lift this up to you in your holy name. Amen. I'd ask the baptism family to come forward at this time. Say a prayer over the water, feel the life that it can give you. It will stay with you forever, in your heart, in your heart. Come be blessed by the Creator, given life by the Redeemer, guided forth by the Sustainer. Child of God, child of God, purest water will rain down on you and will bathe you in the love of God. I got shower of God's blessings there from heaven. Tears are falling, can you feel them? From God's eyes, can you receive them? Child of God, covered in mercy, you are born again. Say a prayer over the water, feel the life that it can give you. It will stay with you forever, in your heart, in your heart. Come be blessed by the Creator. Given life by the Redeemer, guided forth by the Sustainer, child of God, child of God, child of God. The symbol of that song reminds us that we are now bringing into a part of our community of Christ, the child of God. Baudelaire is pouring the water into our basin. Now, although it is not as large as the one at the Holy Temple, it has the same symbol, and that is of purification, of cleansing. It reminds us, just as the temple basin reminded them, of parting of the Red Sea and the fact that they were brought to safety, or the parting of the Jordan River when they walked into the Promised Land. It reminded them their basin of water, of Noah and the Ark, and how they were saved from the flood and as God's chosen people. So this day we also use the water as a symbol of God's love and grace. I've talked to several people about baptism and what it means, and sometimes there's confusion if you come from different faith traditions. And the Catholic Church has an understanding known as original sin that gets wiped out through baptism. And evangelical churches, when we do baptism, is a ritual known as prevenient grace. John Wesley talked about this. We realize that persons still need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ in order to be saved. But what this symbol and ritual remind us of is the fact that the parents promised to raise this child in the Christian faith. And that we as a congregation also promised to raise this child in the Christian faith until that day where they can accept Jesus Christ for themselves. Do you promise to repent of your sin and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior who has died for you and for all of us for the forgiveness of our sins? What name giveth you this child this day? Silas James Pelkey. We baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. At this time, Silas is going to be carried out in the congregation. And the reason we do that is a symbolism to remind you that each of us are, in essence, baptizing this child this day. The fact that we are involved in the community um, and asked to be someday maybe a Sunday school teacher or a youth leader or something else to help nurture this child, we are making the same commitment this day. Please join in the responsive reading that will be on the screen here. <laughs> Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as a member of the family of Christ. Let's remember Silas as the newest member of the family of Christ this day. We give the couple, uh, the family members here, it's a baptism certificate and a candle. And the candle, again, is a symbol that they can use just like a birthday candle. That every year during this time, they can relight that candle and remember their baptism until the time when Silas is old enough to accept Jesus Christ himself. This time we're receiving our, our tithes and our offerings. You may be seated if you like. Thank you. And as we receive our tithes and offerings, I just remind people that one of the joys of giving are for things just like this that we have a wonderful children's ministry at Crossroads Church to help nurture people like Silas as they get older and in the nursery and in the children's church and on Wednesday night cross training that when we give of our resources, we're able to have these types of programs to help raise our child in the Christian faith. Let us pray. Lord, as we receive your tithes and offerings this morning, let us use them to your ministry and service. As you gave the offerings in the Holy Temple this day, let us remind ourselves that we also give offerings to glorify you and to edify one another. It's in your name we pray. Amen. This song was written by Kristen Hewson, as many of you know. And as she shared with me, she said she wrote it at a time in her life that, that she felt very isolated and separate from God. And it was a very lonely, difficult time for her. And I think it fits in nicely with Paul's discussion today about Solomon when he had it all, but then didn't have it all. And what he was probably feeling. And I think it's a great reminder when I, when I listen to the words of the song, I envision it that it's actually Jesus Christ talking to me and reminding me that in my moments of the greatest despair and loneliness, that all I have to remember is look up because he's going to be there. When your days just disappear Without a care and your faith has left you bare if you look up through the doubt in your mind i'll be I'll When the loneliness eats you inside Nowhere to hide And the bitterness cuts like a knife If you look up Through the shame in your heart
like no one hears the cry in your voice and you fight to hold back the tears if you look up through the pain in your soul I'll be I'll be I'll be the one who will make you whole I'll be the one who will embrace your soul I'll be the one whose love won't die I'll be the one who will never say I'll be Okay, thank you guys for all coming today. Our closing song is uh, Be Bold, Be Strong. And I think it's a message that uh, we should remind ourselves every day when you get up and you're heading out the door, that if you're being bold and you're being strong in your faith walk with Christ, then all things are possible, even when you're having an awful day, okay? Because they're not really awful days. <laughs> Congratulations to the Pelkey family. Amen. Amen. Please rise. Sing with us. Be bold. Be bold. Be strong. Be strong. For the Lord your God is with you. Be bold. Be bold. Be strong. Be strong. For the Lord your God is with you. Walking in faith and victory, come on and walk in faith and victory, for the Lord, your God, is with you. From the top. Go in peace.